Impact of Influence, the tragic story of a powerful South Carolina family and the mysterious deaths that they are linked to. Hi there, Matt Harris and Seton Tucker. Welcome to another episode, and we're so happy to have you here, and we're always thankful, always grateful. We want to point that out. We wouldn't be able to keep doing this without your support and your wise words and your positive and negative feedback. How do they get a hold of us, Seton? You can reach us on our Facebook page, which is Murdoch Podcast, or on our website, which is MurdochPodcast.com. So today we're going to be talking about, well, some of the grief we've gotten over the last episode. We'll get to it in a second. We're going to be talking about some motions that have been filed, different judges that have recused themselves from some of the, the one case that's going on. But we begin with former district attorney and also a former defense attorney. He is John Snyder. And before we get started, John, we want to play a little clip for you and for everyone from episode 41 of our show that was posted on February 4th. So that is a little over a month ago as we're recording right now. And this is what uh, John said in that episode. The other little wrinkle is there's still the issue of Buster. (laughs) And so it is possible for Alec to reject his interest in the property, in the estate, and then it would pass down to the next heir. Wait, so you're saying that Alec could say, I do not accept the fact that Maggie willed it to me. I'm passing, and whoever's next in line can have it. It goes to Buster. And in that case, a lot of people would not have as much claim to it if Alec doesn't own it. They'd have no claim. That's exactly right. So, Mr. John, you nailed it. Uh, Again, that was episode 41, if you want to go back and listen to it. The week of us recording this, it was official. Alec Murdoch has given up his right to accept any interest in the estate of his late wife, Maggie Murdoch. That was filed in Colleton County Probate Court. Maggie's stake in Moselle, which is the Colleton County property, which is actually in two counties, uh, where she and her son were found murdered on June 7th, and in Edisto Beach House, then fall to the surviving child, Buster Murdoch Jr. All this coming from, well, we've actually gotten the documents, plus Island Packet, etc. So we actually had a question from one of our listeners, Nancy Walker, and she has a question for John. She says, do you think it's possible that he may have alerted them to the possibility of doing this? Seems like quite a coincidence that he talked about this just a few weeks ago on your podcast, and then bam. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, No, the only people that I talk to about this are you and Matt, and no one contacted me. That's just what what people would know to be how the law works regarding estates. I mean, they're surrounded by attorneys in this family. They they can figure stuff out. A probate attorney would probably know that. Anybody that's been to law school would know that. But I still think it's amazing. I didn't see it anywhere else or read it anywhere else. So I give you kudos. Don't don't uh, take the credit away from you. Well, it's it's going to be the basis for my new podcast. John Snyder is right. Um, <laughs> we won't get. It may only be one episode, but it, it should be it should be fun to listen. One to. and short. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I also hope that the victims of financial crimes and also the boating accident survivors receive the money that is due to them. How does that work, John? Yeah, so I would start off with the premise to all of our listeners, which is we are trying to inform people of how the system works. And everyone who listens, they're able to make their own opinion of whether they agree with that part of the system or not. And so When I'm talking about how the law is going to operate, that's not my personal opinion about what I think should happen, or is it any kind of statement regarding the guilt or innocence of the parties? Rather, we're dealing with highly technical areas of all kinds of law in this unique case, and so we're trying to explain that as openly and as clearly as possible. So no opinion should be gathered over our opinions of the victims or over what the results of things might be for a particular family. We, you know, we, we just want people to understand like, Hey, this could happen in this case and people should be aware. 
that's our job as educating the people that are listening. Good. And you made the call on that and it could happen or it did happen. But now we move on to what does happen because of that. And there has been another filing in response to Alex say he was giving up his right to accept the estate of, of Maggie. Explain what was filed just before we started recording this. So today is the receiver has filed a motion to basically set aside and hold Alex in contempt for basically to say, Alex, even though you thought you could do that, that's part of the receiver's job. And you doing that makes the receiver come to court and say, judge, we need to hold you in contempt for Alex taking this step. And that would be John Lay and Peter McCoy, who are the receivers. They're in charge of all of Alex Murdoch's financial stuff. And they're saying, because in in the order, it said Alec is barred from transferring any of his assets, including inherited assets. But my question to you, John Snyder's attorney would be, but is he really transferring? If he never accepted, how can you transfer? That very question is going to be, that will be litigated heavily because that's a That is a great question. And there's two things to analyze in this. One is, it's very clear that the judge ordered the receiver to be in charge of all of his finances and his financial decisions. But he also has the ability to make legal decisions. When I say legal, I mean, he can decide if he was out on bond, whether to drive a car. He can still make independent decisions that affect his legal status. And so the question that the court will have to answer is, was his repudiation repudiation of his interest in Moselle a legal decision, which is unaffected and not part of the judge's order, or was it a financial decision? And if the court determines it was a financial decision, this motion that was filed today would would be binding, and the and the uh-huh. judge would order that that repudiation not be observed. At first blush, it sounds to me like you're not sure how that could go. You could make very strong arguments either way. And here's the other thing we have not even gotten into is if Alec was in any way a party to or responsible for the death of Maggie and I'm saying if and big capital red flashing letters, then another aspect of the law would would take effect called the Slayer Statute, which means if somebody is responsible for the death of someone, they can't benefit from the death. So if uh, Seton takes out a life insurance policy on me, and names her as the beneficiary, and then you know my brake lines are cut and I go off a cliff. She can't recover under under the insurance policy if she was the one that cut the brake lines. Sure, sure. There's a whole set of things we don't know yet, and that would that will trump this legal debate over whether it was a financial decision or a legal decision. Buster has been named in litigation. Is it possible that he would decline the inheritance as well? No, his liability is going to be limited. Remember, we're in South Carolina, so we've got comparative negligence going on. So the amount of his liability might only be a small percentage. You know, Obviously, he wasn't driving the boat at the time of the accident. He wasn't a partner at any of the law firms. So any role or liability that he might have is going to be so minimal that it wouldn't affect his ownership interest in Moselle in any substantial way upon its sell. And we should point out that he is listed because he gave his ID to his brother, Paul, who allegedly was driving the boat and who else was murdered. The plaintiffs have alleged that Buster provided his driver's license. Yes, yes. That, yeah, that's still not, 
We haven't seen anything beyond that, nor has there been a criminal charge issued to that effect either. So the Island Packet actually has a quote from John Marvin, who is Alec's brother. We should point out John Marvin, by the way, is not an attorney, uh, and he's in charge of handling Maggie's estate. What he said was he got a copy of the disclaimer via FedEx, sent it to a probate attorney, and he says, I don't know much about it. I don't know much about probate law. He's essentially saying, listen, I don't want it. Pass it along as how I've understood it. Whatever the court tells me to do, I'm doing it. When he says he's referring to his brother, Alec. So he is implying or saying that it came out of nowhere. He didn't see it coming. Would it matter who else was involved in Alec's decision to pass on the inheritance? No. Like if Randy influenced him, his brother influenced him or something, would any of that matter? No, I mean, if Alex is the one that's subject to this court order, and Alex is the one that has to be in compliance with it. Now, the court order specifically says that Alex is free to consult with lawyers, consult with people, and make his own decisions. The representative of the estate is merely being notified by Alex that he's disclaiming And then he submits that disclaimer to the court, just like he would uh, if he published a notice of creditors in the newspaper about anybody that that Maggie might have owed money to. They have a certain amount of time to make claims on the estates. And that's just a normal part of of working out in the state. So we, you know, we know that the co-receivers have filed this motion. Will there be further motions filed by Tinsley, the attorneys for the Beach family, and some of the other boating uh, passengers, and also some of the people who might also have claims due to financial improprieties? They might file a brief in support of receiver's motion, but the receiver is acting on all the financial issues and including the creditors potentially. And let's move over to the shuffling of the judges. And we talked about this on our last episode, is we're looking to get a ruling on whether jailhouse tapes featuring Alec Murdoch should be released. And we've had four judges now have the possibility of seeing it, two uh, backed out for some sort of conflict. And then let's see, what what did the third one back? Tell me about the third one, Seton. So there was Judge Mary Geiger Lewis of Columbia, and her late husband was a close friend of Dick Harputlian, who we know is Alex, one of Alex's attorneys. And Dick Harputlian spoke at the funeral of her late husband in November of 2017. Also, when Harputlian was elected a senator in 2018, Judge Lewis administered his oath. And also noting is that Jim Griffin, who is the one of Alex's other attorneys, was a former law partner of Lewis's late husband. Did a lot of connections with that judge, so she saw the conflict. And now we go to the current judge that may be hearing the case. And her name again, uh, Seton? Her name is Michelle Childs, and she has been the fourth judge who has been assigned in the last week. So where a little bit of controversy comes in is she previously worked for Nexton, Pruitt, Jacobs, and Pollard. And this firm, a very prestigious law firm in the state of South Carolina, but they own a PR firm called NP Strategy. NP Strategy was hired by the Murdoch family to represent them after the deaths of Maggie and Paul for some PR reasons, I guess to probably do some damage control. Fitz News reported that Childs used NP strategies to help her with her bid to become the next Supreme Court nominee. She was in contention with the Biden administration to become a Supreme Court nominee. So she filed some paperwork. And John, can you break this down for us? Yeah. Uh, What she did was she actually filed an order in the civil action to invite the parties to challenge her ability to hear the the matter and 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 challenge as i say she goes through and lays out a factual basis of i understand that there's news reports questioning my ability to be fair and partial i understand that there are factual allegations being made 
here is my response to those factual allegations. She lays out the fact that she worked for Nexon Pruitt in the late 90s into early 2000. She lays out the fact that she has never done any work with the uh, NP Strategy LLC and her knowledge. So she has no direct connection with that, that business. And that her law clerk did at one point work for Dick Harputlian. What's interesting about this is she then goes on to say, if either side feels that I'm not qualified to hear this, please file a motion. And here's a deadline for when the motion needs to be filed by. And I read this and I see a judge who wants to be above reproach. This is a judge that has had bipartisan support throughout her career on the federal bench. And she does not want to do anything to solely the reputation of the bench or her own re reputation. And so she's laying out any issues that people might have. And then if either the plaintiff or the defendants have an issue that they are invited to come and, and raise that issue before her. This is a judge who's being proactive and wanting to be above uh, reproach from people that that appear in her court and, and the general public. And obviously, if she's, if she's going to be considered for the Supreme Court, she's going to be of high quality. Whether you agree with her, her, her purported politics, dummies don't get nominated to the Supreme Court or even get, get thrown into the pool of potentially being nominated to the Supreme Court. Or become a federal court judge. Or become a federal court judge. We're going to take a break and talk about our friends at Drizzly. Drizzly telling you to look for a reason to celebrate every day. Celebrate a friend for their promotion or baby or wedding, any little thing. Just a, a day that was magnificent. And Drizzly can come to your door. That's why you love it, Seton. Yes, I'm always a fan of convenience, and it's the best way to buy beer, wine, and spirits with delivery to your doorstep in under 60 minutes. Is Drizzly the number one app for alcohol delivery? Drizzly is giving all new customers $5 off their first order with code FAST5, F-A-S-T-5. So download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. And use promo code FAST5 for $5 off your first order. Drizzly, now... You don't have to drive around. It just comes to you. Love it. Drizzly. Well, so another thing that I just want to talk about is, you know, South Carolina is a small state. So I'm kind of thinking all of these attorneys, they're going to attend the same conferences. Most, they're going to know each other. So how does it work in a state this size to hear stuff and not have connections? And wh when do those connections become to a point that you need to recuse yourself? The very thing that we're we're here talking about today, that here's somebody that was was abusing the system, where the grand majority of lawyers avoid any of these issues that Alex is is accused of. Most lawyers are upfront and say, "Hey, I know this person. We were friends in law school. This might help you in this case." This might hurt you in the case. And sometimes you can get deep into a case and be like, hey, I'm beginning to see a trend in interactions or how pivotal somebody's role might be as a witness. And so I'm going to I'm going to recuse myself and, and withdraw from from the case over a conflict. So lawyers do it all the time. And and for, you know, hundreds of years, South Carolina has has been able to operate with it being a small bar. So sometimes a small bar is great because everybody knows everybody else's business. And so you don't get away with things. Now, uh, sometimes small bars are bad because lawyers get to be on both sides of the cases and, and uh, you have issues like you had here in, in Hampton County. Do you think this is one reason why we've had four judges in the last week? Yes, I mean, so North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, these are these are some of the 
the largest states in the country. And South Carolina is rolling in at 39th. So just the, it's hard to imagine if you, if you don't, haven't lived there or been there, how small it is. So, you know, if you've been to Myrtle Beach or you've been to Charleston or Columbia or Greenville, those are the exceptions. And, and the rest of South Carolina is 10 mile drives between little hamlets that might have a stoplight. Yeah. And it's also important to point out, I think that Dick Harputlian has been around a long, long time and he's been a prosecutor, uh, head of the Democratic Party. It'd be pretty hard not to have some sort of connection if you've done anything in law over the last 30, 40 years to not have had major interactions with Dick Harputlian, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. Yeah. Law, politics, and business are all areas where he's excelled. And I mean, he's been a household name. He's known across the country because when South Carolina was was the second primary for the president, Harputlian was on every national news media yes. that there was. And so it, it's just going to be impossible to find anyone in the professional legal community that hasn't had some interaction with him in, in a state the size of South Carolina. But that certainly doesn't mean you can't be fair and, and just. Did you have some motions you wanted to run uh, yeah, well, down real quick? So one thing that I actually thought was really interesting was Vicki Ward, who is a journalist out of New York City. She was tried to be served an affidavit of, of service on January 7th. And in this document, the doorman advised that Miss Ward had moved to an undetermined address. Um, so I just kind of had questions. What happens when you can't find somebody? Just backtrack just for a second, because people might not want know why they're looking for Vicki Ward. They're looking for her because she accidentally or whatever released pictures of Mallory Beach's body that she may have gotten from a closed hearing. Basically. Yeah, there was some mediation. There mediation, was a confidential yes. mediation and documents. And right now there's a motion, both sides. So these were related to the boating accident. There, Parker's, the convenience store where the kids allegedly bought the alcohol, uh, they've kind of filed motions. And then Tinsley, who represents the Beach family, along with some other yes. boaters involved in the accident, you know, represents them. And they're, they're kind of legal wrangling going back and forth. I want to figure out who released it, and that's why they need Vicki Ward. Yes. So back to her question. What happens when you can't find somebody? So if, if you can't find somebody for service of a subpoena, you just have to keep digging. You get law enforcement involved. You get a private investigator involved, and eventually you find them. If you can't serve somebody for the purposes of a lawsuit, you can serve a lawsuit by publication. And so you can file, if you go back to a newspaper and, and see legal notices and you'll say an action has been commenced against so-and-so. And so there's other ways to serve people of a lawsuit with, where they're a party to the lawsuit in the event that you can't find them. And so it, what this sounds like is they're trying to serve her with a subpoena and they haven't been successful in locating her. I want to touch on one last thing before we let you go. And this podcast has been accused uh, by trolls and whatnot of being in the pocket of the Murdoch family, which is insane to think, why the heck would they choose us two who had not done a podcast before? And I will pontificate just for a second, and people may not care what I have to say, but I will. I've always been intrigued by defense attorneys. If you're a defense attorney and I run into you at some sort of cocktail party or thing, sorry, because I'm going <laughs> to get all up and uh, trying to find out why you do what you do, because it's amazing to me and how important it is. And I think true crime fans may have come across something like the making of murderer or things like this, where people were falsely imprisoned. And when you do that and you get intrigued, like, oh my gosh, how could that happen? You have to have that same philosophy with every person who is charged with something. You have to be consistent with everybody getting a good defense, and that's what makes the judicial system works. So when John analyzes something in the law, it by no means, or we talk about something in the law, 
has anything to do with what we think of his character or whether he's guilty or innocent or any of that. And I, I think it would be easy to do a podcast where every single week we come in and tell you how much of a scumbag Alec Murdoch is. No, and I think we all want Alec Murdoch to be brought to justice. I mean, I think all of us do. um, And I've actually gotten a few messages of this past week because there's so much legal stuff and everyone's wanting to get more information about the victims. We all want that. But sometimes when we're talking about someone else's rights, they think that we're not in the corner of the the other victims, which is not true. Would you like to... uh after we just babbled, or especially me, uh, John Snyder, to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, so we we're trying to inform people of what's going on. I'm trying to explain to people on both sides what what's going to happen with these motions and 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 different legal filings and different aspects, and what could happen with different aspects and different filings. So so there's two parts. One is I want the system to work because it is the greatest system in the country. Our particular country has experienced some rougher than normal times and how we relate to people over perceived failings of the criminal justice system. And so I believe that we need to protect people's constitutional rights, even when they are the worst people in the world. We still want the system to operate the way it is required to, so that when it happens to somebody that wasn't the worst person in the world, they are afforded the same protection. And so uh, one of the reasons I feel so strongly about that is my faith, my faith life requires me, and I believe that we all, in my worldview, Jesus was was a defense attorney. Uh, we 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 needed his grace and his atonement for who we would be without him. And so, if if we all got, if everybody that's listening got what they deserved, in in my religious worldview, it would be unpleasant. And so, thankfully. Somebody has interceded on my behalf in in my view. And, and, and so we all need the system to work in case we ever run into the system or our kids get pulled over on a dark road driving back from a high school baseball game or our mom is stopped somewhere uh, just because a taillight is out. The system has to work even if it's a really, really bad guy who's part of the the justice system right now. And so it is not in any way a a opinion or judgment on the on the victims and and the the, the actions. Rather it's saying, hey, we want the, the Beach family to get justice. And so we're going to call balls and strikes on the system as it's going through to say, hey, this motion might not be successful and might undermine justice being achieved in that case. Or we might say, hey, um, the release of these audio tapes might cause a judge to take some severe action like dismissing a criminal case. And, And so we bring these points up not because we think somebody should get away with evil. Rather, we want to make sure that nobody can attack the system so that a bad person walks free. You've got to let the system work. And when when people demand kind of this lynch mob mentality, that's the very thing that, that we all were pretty clear about last summer that we were against to not ignore people's due process and it's not it's not cool and it's not hip to say hey wait a second let's let the justice system work but as a country we have to let it work and we we've got to protect people while they're going through the system then when it is time and they are found guilty we know we we won't we don't go back and complain and say it was rigged or it was unfair we can say hey Law enforcement was so careful in these cases, and they did their job 
absolutely the way they need to do it. And that guy's never getting out of jail. And I can say as a prosecutor, the four years I was a prosecutor, that's how we did things. That's how law enforcement did things. And I have not had any cases where I've had to go back and testify, where I've been subpoenaed to go testify. And, and that's because you let the process work. And then you, when you're, you're satisfied with the result because you know the process worked. All right, John. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. I'll talk to you soon. Later, Slater. Bye. All right. One in the bag. And uh, thank you so much. Rate it, if you would, please. And share it, if you would, please. And, of course, we uh, take your comments. Facebook. You can go to Murdoch Podcast. You can go to our website, MurdochPodcast.com. And we will talk soon. And now, a Best Fiends affirmation. Your husband brags that he recorded 200,000 steps in the last month, but you're at level 3,832 on Best Fiends. Who deserves the bragging rights now? With over 7,000 brain-boosting, challenging levels, bragging never felt so easy. So download Best Fiends free from the App Store or Google Play today. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Play.